James Galvin is a scholar of Middle Eastern history. He has been a faculty member in the Department of History at the University of California, Los Angeles since 1995 and has written extensively on the history of the modern Middle East with particular emphasis on nationalism and the social and cultural history. He is the author of five books on current Middle Eastern issues. His most recent is The Arab Uprisings, What Everyone Needs to Know. Now, a year after the Egyptian Revolution, James Galvin, like many of his colleagues, did not foresee the overwhelming victory of the Islamist parties in the elections. There were three aspects of the elections that uh, we didn't see, that we got wrong, um, but I don't think were really foreseeable. First of all, the very fact that there were going to be elections, that the military was going to allow elections to take place anyway, uh, is something that was very, very iffy. And then what sort of elections and the style of elections. So we can't be totally faulted to people such as myself for not seeing this stuff happening. But the three aspects of the elections that came as a surprise was, number one, the size of the victory of the Muslim Brotherhood. There was polling as late as June of uh, uh, last year in which the Brotherhood was getting somewhere around 15 percent of the vote. And there was an occasional brave soul out there that said 40 percent, 40 percent, but most of us didn't see 40 percent. Most of us saw a lot less. Um, and we were pretty much disabused of that in the most recent elections. The second thing that we didn't see was the, was the power of the Salafists. The Salafists are very, very new on the Egyptian political scene. They've been around for a while, but mainly they had scorned political involvement, and they actually mocked the Brotherhood for its uh, attempts to enter into the political process. Their attitude was that there is a moral awakening that needs to take place before a, a society, Egyptian society, is fit for an Islamic government. They came in very, very late, but they had, ach had acquired so much moral capital by the time that they came in uh, through a whole variety of uh, civil society programs that they ran through charitable works by conducting traffic in Alexandria. I mean, these were things that they actually, you know, were able to build on so that they very, very quickly were able to uh, uh, create a, a strong political force and achieve approximately 20 percent of the vote. And then the final thing that a uh, few of us actually saw was the um, way in which secular parties would uh, fare, as they have, coming in a distant third. Um, this is not something that we had thought. We had thought that the, they would be far more popular. We thought that uh, uh, the uh, Brotherhood, for example, would be fairly successful, but that these parties as well be, would be successful. And then, as I said, we were disabused of that finally as well. The question of fair and legitimate elections uh, is, is a complex one. I mean, obviously, when you have a uh, result of the Muslim Brotherhood getting 40 percent and the Salafists getting uh, 20 percent and so on and so forth, it's certainly more legitimate than the elections that were held previously. Um, in 2010, for example, the Brotherhood got nothing. In 2005, they got 20 percent of the vote. But the question actually is made more complex in the sense that the process itself was extraordinarily complex. I've read over the um, uh, instructions for forming of the blocks and the forming of the parties and so on and so forth. It's very, very difficult for me to figure this out. So you can imagine how difficult it might have been for uh, an Egyptian uh, voter to figure out exactly what was going on, exactly what was expected of him. There were proportional representations. There were party blocks. There was. Uh, individuals who uh, uh, were run. You had uh, people fitting into the category of worker peasant or professional. You had certain uh, uh, seats set aside for specific groups. So it was just very, very difficult to comprehend what was going on. As far as we know, it was mainly free and fair. As far as we know, the, uh, for example, the Carter people uh, were there and they vouchsafed for it. On the other hand, it was a slugfest. Uh, there was a, uh, a lot of reports of dirty tricks being used, false information being passed, uh, people uh, being herded to the polling stations, that sort of thing as well. It uh, was more, let's say, of a Chicago-style election than I think Egyptians were probably expecting. The problem now is holding a revolution in this 
time period, starting from the, uh, from the 1980s all the way through now, there's only one game in town, and that's uh, neoliberal uh, economics. And so the, uh, uh, there's not going to be the sort of, you know, up by our, our own bootstraps economic nationalism that you saw, for example, in the 1950s and the 1960s. It's impossible today. And one of the problems, of course, is, is that it was neoliberalism itself that sparked, in, in part, that sparked these uprisings. Uh, the difference between rich and poor, for example, the, um, uh, in, in the Arab world, which, by the way, um, America is still exceeds the Arab world in the difference between uh, the very rich and the very poor, the gap that's, that's there. Uh, the privatizations, the crony capitalism that emerged because of the privatizations, the fear of, uh, of layoffs, the uh, uh, cuts in the subsidies, for example, that, that have taken place. Uh, over time. The, all these things were, were uh, things that sparked the uprisings. All these things now are the things that uh, these governments are faced with doing. Egypt is an economic uh, uh, backwater at this point, and Egypt is not going to be able to change its position at all in this time period. The question is what the general aspirations of the Egyptian people are, if there is something that we can say is a general aspiration. Certainly when you have 40% winning, 40% uh, of the winners being the Muslim Brotherhood, 20% of the winners being the Salafists, there are 10% of the population, of course, is Coptic Christian. They were undoubtedly not very happy at, at those results. Uh, the uh, uh, women's uh, Bloc, for example, uh, you constantly see stuff coming out of Egypt saying that one of the big losers uh, of this Egyptian re uh, revolution was women um, whose rights had been supported by Hosni Mubarak's wife uh, very, very strongly. So uh, there are people who are dissatisfied with the way things turned out. Of course, you have winners and you have losers. Again, though, it was probably a, a fairly fair, uh, if, uh, uh, let's say, a raucous event. <laughs> The Muslim Brotherhood originated in Egypt. It was founded in the late 1920s by Hassan Habana. Um, it is the premier um, Islamist organization. Uh, it has shifted over time. Uh, you have to understand that throughout the Middle East, there were chunks of time when Islamism tended to follow similar strategies and similar tactics, and then because of various outside forces had to shift. For example, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, itself uh, was uh, uh, very much repressed under Gamal Abdel Nasser. It began to therefore uh, tow closer to the uh, Nazarist line, pledged allegiance to the state in the 1970s and uh, uh, later on. Um, and you had a series of uh, uh, very, very violent confrontations between defectors from the Brotherhood uh, and the Egyptian government, culminating in the massacre, for example, that took place in the 1980s uh, or so. Um, but the one thing in Egypt and throughout the rest of the Arab world, the repression was both extremely effective and extremely counterproductive. Because, uh, for example, they were able to uh, force the Brotherhood to, as I said, pledge allegiance to the system, to participate in uh, the political process, be it as it may. Um, they couldn't operate as a free political party, of course, but they could back independent candidates for office, and they won 20 percent of the vote in uh, 2005. Mubarak in 2010 made sure that didn't happen again. Um, but um, in various other places as well, the Muslim Brotherhoods uh, have uh, agreed to cooperate with various governments. Uh, for example, in Libya, um, uh, they uh, sat down in dialogue for a while with uh, Gaddafi. Uh, even in Syria, where it had been viciously repressed in 1982, the Brotherhood then turned around and said, well, the government can't be that bad because it's good on the Palestinian question, and so we can't do anything to undercut the government because of its you know, progressive politics in terms of foreign policy. So in that way, the uh, repression was very, very effective. But as I said, the repression also was counterproductive, because this repressive apparatus that the uh, governments had set up in Egypt and Tunisia, in uh, uh, Morocco, and various other places, tended to grow, expand, 
And uh, over time, it became the major, one of the major sources for the uh, 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 uprisings today that you know, broke out in 2010. The labor movement played a critical role in the revolution, there's no doubt about it. As a matter of fact, there were strikes up and down Egypt on the 10th of February, the day before Mubarak uh, uh, was forced to step down, and very likely the army had had enough. But immediately thereafter, the army told people to get back to work and to stop the strike wave. The strike wave has in part continued, but labor appears to be one of the big losers in this election, and this for several reasons. Uh, most importantly is the fact that uh, the uh, Brotherhood and the Salafists are not particularly friendly towards labor. That uh, one of the reasons for the upsurge in labor activism in the last 10 years or so has been the implementation of neoliberal policies in Egypt, privatizations, the attempt to create free markets, and so on and so forth. Labor is very afraid of privatizations. They uh, uh, view it as a, a quick and easy way of just destroying the labor movement, cutting wages, uh, 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 laying people off, and, and that sort of thing. Unfortunately, the, uh, for labor, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists both have made noises indicating that they plan to continue um, uh, with neoliberal policies. They do it at the same time, of course, that they say they are for social justice, which is a very strange attempt to try to square the circle here. You can't have it both ways. In terms of economic policy, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, very likely is closer to the uh, Republican Party than it is to the Democratic Party. Um, I was talking to students earlier today, and uh, if there is an equivalent in American politics, it would be the Muslim Brotherhood is probably closer to Newt Gingrich, the Salafists are closer to Rick Santorum, uh, with the obsession over uh, uh, issues such as morality and ethics and that sort of thing. Young, secular people were at the forefront of the revolutionary movement. Egyptian scholar Rabab El Mahdi was one of them. And for me, this is something very inspiring and reassuring, because it means that no one can actually broker deals to stop uh, the revolution. That it will continue to go on until the people, the masses who made it a revolution, believe that they have been satisfied. And hence, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not worried about the fact that there are no leaders or that no one is coming uh, 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 up or uh, will be able to, who, who is going to be able to win elections. We've, we've broken such a huge barrier with this revolution that for me it actually doesn't matter. If we end up with a parliament that does not perform it's towards the way we think it, it should perform its chores, we will take to the streets and we will change the parliament. To the surprise of many experts, the secular movement was buried in an Islamist landslide. Well, there's a couple of theories. Number one, that we had just totally underestimated the popularity of the Islamist parties. But it's not just popularity, it has to do with their organizational capability. It was far superior to that of the liberals. For example, the April 6 movement debated whether or not it would enter into uh, the election as a party, and they decided, no, they weren't going to do that. There was a lot of political naivete on the part of the so-called liberals, on the part of the secular forces, um, as to what the outcome was going to be. The other thing, of course, is that maybe as Westerners, we saw what we wanted to see in terms of the revolution. We tended to focus on the, the English-speaking, social networking youth in Tahrir Square. Uh, labor, for example, was pretty much ignored in the American media, and the uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood as well. The popularity very likely was just overlooked. There were several reoccupations in Tahrir Square. Um, one of them was appeared to be just a major rally by the Muslim Brotherhood, um, but there were other ones that uh, the Brotherhood shared with the secularists, and still others that were mainly the secularists uh, alone. Uh, the 
Uh, Tahrir Square occupation, uh, according to polls, was extremely, extremely unpopular in Egypt. The, set, the occupation, the most recent occupation, in, uh, in November, for example, that approximately 90% of the Egyptian population, the population that was polled, objected to it, thought that this, that this should stop. They looked at it as being disruptive. They wanted to get their lives back in order. At the end of the day, it's very likely that the elections will, for example, take place, that there will be a political process that, that they can participate in. The Egyptian population has won that. It looks very likely that the army may go back to its barracks uh, so long as its privileges are protected and so long as there is immunity for events that have recently transpired, since, particularly since November of this year. Um, so that's something that's happened. In terms of economic policy, however, uh, the Egyptian government, starting with the so-called cabinet of businessmen that Mubarak put in, has accelerated its, the Egyptian acceptance of neoliberal economics, privatizations, etc. And it's very unlikely that that is going to be reversed. Uh, when Barack Obama, uh, at the end of the street phase, the first street phase of the Egyptian revolution, uh, made his speech t about Tunisia and Egypt, he said that the solution is for economic reform, the solution is further neoliberal economic policies. Uh, if Barack Obama wanted to do something for the Tunisian and Egyptian populations, there's one thing he could, could have done very, very quickly, which is to end uh, subsidies for biofuels in the United States. There has been a tacking up tremendously of the price of food in the Middle East. The Middle East is the world's large, uh, the Arab world is the world's largest food importer of all the regions in the world. Uh, Egypt alone is the world's largest food importer of all the region, uh, regions in the world. And the uh, American subsidies for uh, biofuels has certainly done nothing but to make the price of grains, uh, particularly wheat, go up as well. So uh, along those lines, uh, the, the United States could have done something more effective, but it wasn't politically expedient for us to do that. The army is firmly in control, and that was one of the questions as to what was going to happen in terms of the reoccupation of Tahrir Square, whether or not the army would use that as an excuse to cancel the election, just try to impose top-down control, uh, you know, direct control itself, as opposed to allowing the parliamentarians to, to go through the uh, motions of rewriting the Constitution and uh, the other things. The military is, uh, has attempted to dictate the nature of the Constitution. They have attempted to stake out a position for themselves in the Egyptian government that would allow them to retain their privileges, allow them to retain a certain control over the political process. And this has been the major bone of contention between people like Baraday and, and uh, uh, others uh, and the military. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood, very interestingly, has walked a thin line on this one, walked a tightrope. Uh, number one, they really want the military to go back to their barracks. Number two, they also realize that they're going to have to give certain reassurances to the military um, uh, in order to get them to go back to their barracks. The military is very, very, very strong. Um, it's the uh, largest military in the Middle East uh, in sheer numbers. Um, and it plays a very, very active role in a whole variety of uh, aspects of the Egyptian politics, Egyptian economy. Uh, you have to remember that starting with Gamal Abdel Nasser and then Anwar Sadat, uh, uh, they came out of the military. Hosni Mubarak came out of the Air Force uh, as well. Uh, there was a certain demilitarization that was taking place and the distancing uh, between, from uh, the presidency and the military. But over time, uh, what the military was relegated into a very, very important economic role. And this in part had to do with buying it off uh, after the Camp David Accords, with military was very unhappy. The reason for being a military in the first place was to fight Israel. And with the Camp David Accords, of course, they've lost their reason for being. So they had to have a new reason for being. And that new reason for being actually became econ economics. 
Uh, the uh, IMF estimates that the Egyptian military controls approximately 50% of the manufacturing in Egypt. They have access to an enormous amount of uh, uh, labor, for example, through uh, conscript labor. They have privileged uh, uh, priority rights to uh, raw materials. They can conduct those raw materials where they want. They also, uh, military bases, of course, were on the borders, uh, frequently uh, uh, places that uh, were on uh, seasides. And uh, so there was a great deal of uh, a possibility for exploitation for tourism uh, as well. So the military controlled everything from farms to uh, dairy farms to uh, 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 manufacturing of, of durable goods like washing machines and, and so on and so forth, televisions, uh, tourist industry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's a very, very strong role in the Egyptian economy. And it's been uh, one of the things that people began to look at was that it's very possible that the military's uh, very, very quick roundup of those people around Gamal Mubarak and uh, the, the fat cats um, had to do with its uh, jealousy over their uh, privileged access, number one, and secondly, different economic uh, goals that they had. Uh, they weren't as attached to international capital, they weren't as attached to neoliberal uh, policies, uh, obviously. Uh, they are part of the government and uh, they do control manufacturing, so it's a direct contradiction of what neoliberalism is all about. So very likely what happened was that they used the immediate aftermath of the revolution to strike against their uh, economic opponents. In other places in the Middle East you find similar things, not the same amount of control, but for example uh, the Syrian construction industry is controlled by the army, pretty much. Um, there are other people in the, you know, as well associated with it, but you know, the army is a very, very important player in, in the economy. If there is a ray of hope, it might be Tunisia. Um, but even there, um, Tunisia's got serious problems. It's got serious uh, regional uh, differences in terms of the coastal regions, for example, actually have been able to take advantage of um, uh, globalization in terms of tourist industry and that sort of thing. But certainly the inland areas, which are more industrial, textiles, etc., have not been able to take advantage of, of globalization. The Middle East is, next to Sub-Saharan Africa, the least globalized region of the world. Its trade is mainly um, uh, to Europe, it's got virtually no trade with you know, the uh, China, for example. Um, it is on, its only uh, advantage, comparative advantage, is its proximity to Europe. Um, so it's not going to get out of this uh, hole that it's in very, very easily. Its major export, of course, is oil. It's a raw material. It is not a manufacturing center. So uh, it's not uh, an area of the world that's going to be hooked in very well to the globalized economy, except in terms of, of exporting oil to the globalized economy. In those terms, the so-called Arab Spring is a misnomer, okay? Spring implies joy, it implies uh, you know, growth, a new beginning, et cetera, et cetera. It's certainly not um, on the horizon, on the immediate horizon that any of that is going to take place. Uh, and if you look at certain places like, for example, Syria, and perhaps Libya, Yemen, Bahrain, it has taken an extraordinarily ugly turn as well. I think the relationship between Egypt and Israel the, has been transformed. In terms of the Israel-Palestine conflict, however, several things have already taken place. One of those is that the military regime has, uh, in Egypt has signaled that it was going to be uh, uh, less of a lapdog in terms of policy than Mubarak administration had been. The Mubarak administration, for example, closed off Gaza uh, for uh, several reasons. Number one, he didn't want to spill over from the, what was in effect the uh, Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, uh, on Egypt. He also didn't want uh, Gaza to be successful to demonstrate that there was possibly an Islamic third way. Um, so he did the American and the Israeli bidding of closing off Gaza. The uh, current regime, 
uh, while it hasn't quite opened up the border with Gaza, has certainly made things a lot looser for uh, Gaza as well, pretty much making it so that the entire uh, attempt to lay Ga siege to Gaza is, is faltering at the present time. There's that aspect of it. There's also the fact that under Mubarak, there, there was the idea that uh, the Egyptians would ostensibly encourage Palestinian reconciliation, but in reality would try to discourage it. In other words, would try to bolster Fatah uh, over uh, uh, Hamas. With the removal of Mubarak, uh, Fatah has lost its biggest ally, uh, and Hamas is possibly going to lose its ally uh, in Syria. Uh, and it's not just that, it's that these guys are dinosaurs, and with the entire set of Arab uprising, there's this whole new model out there uh, for um, uh, political opposition. Fatah and Hamas hears this sort of thing, has looked around and said, my God, we, we've got to do something here. So you have that taking place as well. So, so far, what's going on in Egypt has had demonstrable effects in the Israel-Palestine front. One unfortunate side effect of the revolution has been an increase in violence directed against Egyptian Christians, or Copts. Um, in terms of who is responsible for these actions, we can say that it's very probable that it is people who are associated with the Salafia, with the Salafia tendency. There were also some rumors that there were government agents who were doing it, either the military or former Mubarak loyalists who were doing that. Certainly the discourse in some quarters of uh, the Egyptian population has been that this sort of thing did not happen under Mubarak and would not happen under M Mubarak if Mubarak was back. That's, of course, uh, a wishful th uh, or uh, uh, bad memory because the entire wave of uh, anti-Coptic violence began uh, on uh, Christmas, Coptic Christmas, uh, 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 under Mubarak's watch. So uh, this is something that uh, the um, uh, Arab development um, program calls uh, legitimacy uh, uh, of blackmail, or a better way of putting it would be legitimacy by blackmail. In other words, uh, the legitimacy that the government sought was to say, okay, look, I might be bad, but I'm the only one who are for holding the forces of chaos and sectarianism back, so you have to support me. 